Welcome to the organic chemistry section of our practice MCAT questions. In this video, we're going to be going through questions 121 to 125. So first, I'll show you guys the questions so that you can pause the video and attempt them on your own. Here's question 121, 122, 123, 124, and 125. Now let's go through the questions together. In question 121, we're asked which of the following amino acids contains a hydrophobic side chain. So we have some amino acids, which one has a hydrophobic side chain. The main thing which differs for amino acids is their side chain. Which one is hydrophobic? Isoleucine, yes, it is a hydrophobic side chain. Serine is not, it is polar. Aspartate, also polar. Histine also is polar. So our correct answer is A. And here we can see all of the amino acids, Just a bit smaller. So let's see, isoleucine, the one that's correct. You can see that down here, this is what its side chain looks like. And as you can see, just carbons and hydrogens, therefore it is hydrophobic. Serine is, where is serine? Right here. Polar, it's not charged, but it is polar because of that OH group. So therefore it's not hydrophobic, it's a polar group. Next we have aspartate and histidine. Aspartate is over here, aspartic acid. You can see the carboxylic acid, those two oxygens make it very polar, especially because it can be deprotonated and then therefore have a negative charge, so it's very polar and therefore not hydrophobic. And finally, histidine is over here. It's basic and because it has these nitrogens, it is also polar. These nitrogens, the one over here with the lone pair, can grab protons. So therefore, the only hydrophobic side chain was isoleucine. In question 122, it says decarboxylation involves the removal of a carboxyl group and its replacement with a hydrogen. The carboxyl group is removed as blank. So in decarboxylation, we have removal of the carboxyl group, replacement with hydrogen, it's removed as what? And we're talking about the carboxyl group. When the carboxyl group is removed, it's kind of, you can think about it taken away as a leaving group. What is the form in which it leaves? If we have a reaction, looks kind of like this. Let's say we have OH over here, and then also OH over here. After decarboxylation, let's say that this one on the right was taken away, it will look Let's see, there's another thing, another carbon over there. It will look like this. So this is what the one on the left looks like. The one on the right, how did it leave? It left as carbon dioxide, okay? So you can kind of think about it as the carboxyl group on the right is a leaving group. And what happened is that this bond, the one right here, between that carbonyl carbon and the carbon in the middle was broken. This carbon, broke that bond, so that those electrons went back over here, and then this one would have to break as well. And then the key thing is, this oxygen came and formed another bond with a carbon in the middle. This is not the mechanism by which it happens. I'm just trying to show you that the carbon on the right, the carbonyl one, it wants to form another bond with the oxygen that it's single bonded to, so it has two double bonds to oxygens, and therefore it has to break the bond it has on the left with the other carbon. That's essentially what happens. That is why we get this molecule at the end. The carbon now has two double bonds to the oxygen, and then the rest of it looks like this. It's pretty much the rest of the molecule as if the carbonyl on the right and left is a leaving group. So B is a correct answer. It left as carbon dioxide. Make sure that you, you know, look into this a little bit more and try to find out the actual mechanism, but you should know mainly that it leaves as carbon dioxide, not monoxide, not formic or acid or formaldehyde. In question 123, it says amino acid residues are held together by in polypeptides by peptide bonds. Another name for a peptide bond is what? So for a peptide bond, another name is what? The peptide bond looks like this. So if we had something like that, so you see that these two are connected by the a nitrogen in the middle.
because we had what did we have we had a carboxylic acid which looks like this and then we had the nitrogen come in and attack the end group of one attached over here yeah so essentially it looks like this this is the main part that you need to keep in mind I think there might be another carbon and then we have another carbonyl but the key part that you need to keep in mind is this we have a carbonyl and then on one side there's a nitrogen on the other side there can be something else like a carbon or another group but on one side it's key that we have a nitrogen so what is that carbonyl where we have a nitrogen on one side so let me, let me just clear everything up what is this group this carbonyl it is an amide so it's an amide bond an ester bond on the other hand looks like this with an OR so it's not a carboxyl bond is with an OH it's not that one either and it's not an amine because an amine is connected to some R group but not a carbonyl so it could be a strand of some carbons but not a carbon double bonded to an oxygen if it's a carbon double bonded to an oxygen it is an amide not an amine bond in question 124 we're asked which of the following conditions decreases the nucleophilicity of a compound so we want to decrease the nucleophilicity of a compound so if we want to decrease nucleophilicity think about what makes something a nucleophile and what makes it a, a good nucleophile versus a weak one strong versus weak so if we had a nitrogen for example if we had NH3 versus something that gave it a bit more electron density then the one with more electron density would be stronger so the key point is something is a nucleophile if it has a lot of electron density and then it's a nucleophile because nucleophile something which loves the nucleus the nucleus has a positive charge with the protons it's something which is seeking out something positively charged meaning an electrophile and it wants to give it its electron density so it can either have you know just some lone pairs which is its electron density or it can be a stronger nucleophile if it has an actual negative charge but a good nucleophile would be something which can actually go in and interact with and react with where the electrophile is for example, if we had an electrophile like this, where the carbonyl carbon is the electrophile, we need something that can come in and you know, access that carbon. But if the nucleophile that we're talking about is too sterically hindered, it's gonna be difficult for it to come in and you know, find a pathway into coming to where the electrophile is. It has to specifically come to that carbonyl carbon in a carbon. If it's too sterically hindered, then it's gonna be difficult for it to reach there option A is therefore incorrect because if we decrease steric hindrance we're making something a smaller molecule therefore it's easier for it to get in and reach where it needs to so it would be a better electrophile we're talking about something which makes it a worse elect elect sorry it would be a better nucleophile we're looking for something which makes it a worse nucleophile option B is saying decrease the electron density yes this is something which would decrease the nucleophilicity of the nucleophile making it a worse nucleophile if it had less electron density so if we had like a nucleophile and we attach something to it which took away electron density such as something electronegative then that would make it a less nucleophilic center option c is saying increase its strength as a base no that would make it a better nucleophile because a lewis base can be something which you know takes this lone pair of electrons such as this nitrogen over here grabs a proton like that so you should know that nucleophiles they have basic behavior so if something is a stronger base then it's also, as a result, a stronger nucleophile because it's a better base if it has more electron density, and then that's the same thing which applies for nucleophiles. And finally, option D is saying increase in its electron density donating groups. So if it had like, you know, whichever part is donating electron density, whichever part has the electron density, that makes it nucleophilic, or if it has something attached to it which is donating more electron density into it, then all of that's going to make it a better nucleophile not a worse we're looking for something which decreases nucleophilicity so b is the correct answer
in question 125, we're asked which of the following is not typically considered an amphipathic molecule. So amphipathic molecules, which one is not that? And what this word means is that there is both a polar and a nonpolar side to a single molecule. So it can, you know, interact with both a polar solvent and a nonpolar one, and it'll have some unique characteristics because of this. Phospholipids are amphipathic molecules. In those, you usually see them depicted with a, a polar head, which is where the phosphate group is. And then there might be some long hydrophobic fatty acid chains. So those tails at the bottom are the non-polar part and the circle head part is where the phosphate is, which is negatively charged and therefore it's a, it's a polar part. Alcohols also are amphipathic because they generally look like ROH. The OH part is polar, but the R part, it can be like a small, just one CH3, or it can be a long hydrophobic chain, a hydrocarbon chain, and that will make it amphipathic because the R part is hydrophobic, the other part is polar. One part's polar, one is not. C, long chain hydrocarbons, that would be something like this. And sorry, that is a correct answer because it's something which is not considered amphipathic because long hydrocarbon chain is just carbons and hydrogens. There's nothing which is polar. All of it is nonpolar, so it's not amphipathic because it only has one type of characteristic, meaning it's only nonpolar. There's no polar part. And finally, fatty acids, those have, they could have like a long chain like this, but at one end, they have something like this. They have a carboxylic acid that acid can be deprotonated because of the carboxylic acid part, it's polar. So that part is polar, whereas the rest is a long hydrocarbon chain, so it's nonpolar. So we have, once again, both those parts. That's it for the questions in this video. If you enjoyed what you saw, make sure to check out our course. The link is right here, as well as in the description below. And in that course, we go through a lot more questions just like this and explain all the different answer options. Other than that, make sure to subscribe here to this channel to stay up to date with the videos here. And that's it for this 